really important to build these relationships with the local farmers. And that's something that we tried to do that we're doing with the meat share. It's like, we want some FaceTime. We want to shake their hands. We want to let them know that we're good people here in the community and we want to support their farm with our dollars and we want to bring them more business because you got to think like, okay, when things get tough, when markets dry up, when there's droughts, when there's shifts in the climate, what are these people going to do? Maybe they have a priority person that they're giving the food to. And good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate you joining us again. I have John Bush here, Live Free Academy creator. Now, this really resonates with me, this workshop that they're going to be doing on the weekend here, Homesteading on a Budget. And I've had so many of you write in and say, please give us more solutions to the problems because I'm good at talking about the problems, talking about winter gardens sometimes, different plants you can grow, how you can you know get your gardens up and running. But why don't we get super into depth on how you can exit and then build out of this current system that we exist in? Because all things are pointing to whether it's happening next week, next month, or even in 2023, things are going south quickly. And the world we knew, and I am going to say past tense, is going to continue to devolve and the liquidation of our planet is underway. So everything is going to change in the way that we perceive money, value, trade, friendships, community, it's all shifting. So to have knowledge like this and a more integrated package on how you can get out and then how do you build these resilient communities, John, I appreciate you joining me today. So floor is yours. And I know you got the workshop coming up. Work, uh, what's that? Homesteading on a budget. So yeah, let's talk about many things because I know everybody's solution hungry right now. So choose your land properly. And I do want to say one last thing about uh, the CBDC. It's a two-part running in parallel system. There's going to be a carbon allocation credit, personal carbon allocation, that's going to be associated with your purchase in addition to the monetary value or whatever you have to pay for it. So I, I just got a couple uh, examples here. There was an online t-shirt seller, and we'll be featuring this in my next video, where they put 68 pounds of carbon for nine t-shirts through the manufacturing process, growing the cotton, processing it, taking it to whatever, and then shipping it off to your house. So that whole process incurred 98 pounds of carbon. So moving forward, you're going to get these personal credits. Now, I was told in the beginning, they're going to be one ton credits, but I'm sure after it's going to move down into the hundreds of pounds for one. So you have to come up with 68 pounds of carbon credits somewhere to even allow your purchase to move forward. Mm. And if you don't have the 68 pounds or the 500 pounds or a one ton allotment that you need to purchase a thing like a light or a TV or a, a motor, or a rototiller or something, you're going to have to go on the open market and then buy that one ton of carbon credit. And these are going to march lockstep. There's going to the CBDCs are fraught full of danger here. They're not going to be just, hey, I got to pay for it. The carbon allocations included in that too. So the thing I still don't have an answer for. So if anybody knows, please leave it in the comments below when we move through the video here. Are you going to be able to just purchase carbon allocation credits with your CBDCs or will that be a forbidden that you're only going to be allotted and that's it, that you can't even buy the CBDC or you can't even buy the carbon allocation credit if you want to, that you're only then you're going to have to wait to the next month and try to accrue six months of those before you can buy a larger ticket item. And me and you, we won't be able to actually buy it on the market. That's only for those who pledge their land to the new carbon uh, capture system or it'll only be for corporations who can offset and trade amongst larger amounts of tons. There's a few unknowns moving with this personal alloc allocation credit here. And you know, if it does reflect in history, people will start creating their own uh, monetary system like they did in the 1930s of IOUs to continue to do business outside that system. It happened before several times in history. Crash back in 1907. Then we go, you know, we come back to what the stock market crash was in the Great Depression. You know, so you see it that individuals and uh, you know cities and communities can start off with their own new system of money outside the regular system because it's truly a trust system and an IOU system of your labor equals this much in a different good or value of a good, period. So there's many options outside. So I don't think that we're in any way, shape or form guaranteed 100% that Klaus is going to make us eat insects and we all have to kato to it and you got to put the chip. I just, I don't think that's going to, you can believe it. And a lot of it's psychological what they're trying to do is they they make yeah. you think they have this ultimate power to control all this and make it happen when they really don't. If everybody just stood up and said no, then no. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think you make a great point. It, it, it matters so much where people reside, where they spend their time, where they live, uh, especially if you have a business, for example. But you said it best. The, the solution to all this stuff is to create the alternatives. And it's critical that we begin creating the alternatives now before this stuff is fully implemented. Uh, and when it comes to alternative currency, it's so important because economies, trade, commerce, it's basically like our lifeblood, right? You can be as self-sufficient as possible and produce as many foods and goods as you can. But at the end of the day, there's needs and wants that we're not capable of producing. We can't do it all. I, mean, I guess you could do it all, but your your existence wouldn't be exactly ideal. It wouldn't be the quality of life that I desire, for example. So it's important that we start building those relationships and those connections now. In fact, we're hosting a meeting for the Central Texas Freedom Cell Network. We have around 700 plus people here in Central Texas that have raised their hand and expressed being a part of this community. And so we're going to host a meeting on September 10th. And I want to lead the meeting and really just lay out some of these problems that we're facing. Everyone's aware of them, but I want to like really hammer at home that this is happening. It's coming down the pike right now. And we're going to spend a good bulk of the meeting creating working groups. So we want to identify the local food producers in the area. We want to identify food producers that are just one circle or two circles outside of our freedom community. And we want to get that down on paper and we want to start giving business to these people. In fact, just recently, my good friend Nomad Brad, who I shared about earlier, he's going to be one of the teachers in the workshop. He organized a meat share. And so essentially we're like, hey, there was a guy that did it before in the Freedom Cell Network, but he moved uh, further east in Texas. And so I was like, hey, Brad, you think you could take lead on this? Let's do another meat share. The time is now with all the talk of food shortages. And again, it's that mindset thing. On the one hand, there's people freaking out. They're not able to get groceries. They're in the city. And on the other hand, after our meat share, we lifted up that uh, the freezer and it was we had an entire freezer completely full of meat because we ended up getting a whole cow butchered. We tried to go for at least a quarter cow, but we sold so many shares in this meat share program uh, that we ended up getting a whole cow butchered. We put together a free report to explain step by step how we did this. So I'll make sure to get you the link you can share with your audience. But it was it was just an example of empowerment, right? A lot of people are afraid, living in fear. They're buying into it, like you said. And in turn, when you think Klaus Schwab is all powerful, then for you, he is all powerful. But if you recognize, no, I'm in control of my life, they're going to try to control me. They're going to try to manipulate me. They're going to try to make me dependent on their systems. But you've declared that you're a powerful human being and you got to take those active steps and take those strategies. So it's important that we build those networks now. Another thing we're going to talk about in this meeting is who is looking for work? Who owns a business? Let's start hiring one another. Let's hire within our community. Let's support one another. We're going to talk about education too, because we got to have a mind for the future generation. Uh, the enemies of freedom most definitely look at their efforts in an intergenerational way, spanning hundreds of years. With, we got to start thinking, how can we equip our children with the knowledge the empowerment and the skills necessary to inherit the world that we're creating and create a better world in, in turn. So it's, it's really critical that people do the work now. And like I shared before, we created a tool to help people connect. It's called the Freedom Cell Network. It's really cool people, a lot of folks that are more conscious. There's very low drama. And one thing that can tear a group apart real fast is bickering, ego, drama, blah, blah, blah. There's very little of that because we're so focused on getting stuff done. We don't have time for that crap. So I invite people to join the network and I invite people to start building those alternative currencies and counter economies right now because it's not very long before the CBD system rolls out, before this carbon allotment system rolls out. And we are going to want to continue to do business with one another and operate outside their system and not do it like we're hiding out in the woods all by ourselves, but still maintain a good quality of life and have those human connections because really that's what life's all about. I'll show you something right here. I get, uh, we get our, uh, well, used to get our milk, butter, cheese, yogurt, that sort of thing from the Amish. 
there's a few Amish, there's three Amish farms that are kind of equally spaced out here, but this is the furthest one from where we're at. I sent this notice out to everybody who does buying. Now, you know, you might have your food procured and we do also, we got lambs live weight and they butchered it for, or they uh, slaughtered it for us. And we butchered it ourselves. Uh, we had a 490 pound calf. We did the same thing. Uh, we've gone through two lambs already at 105, 115 pounds or so. Yeah. You know, it's a skill set to have. And once you get your freezer full and you're like, whoa, that's a lot of meat there. And it is helpful to have somebody share and then, you know, doing the work in. And we try to save everything. And we boil the bones down for the dogs and any of the off cuts and anything that we, we think that can be used, especially when we render the fat down. Um, you know, the dogs love all that stuff, too. So we really try to waste nothing yeah. out of that entire animal. Even the Amish, they keep the hooves and stuff to feed their dogs. And they have those big like mastiffs, like super, uh, don't cross mm -hmm. those things at night because they need to protect their flocks against the uh, coyotes out here. So their dogs are pretty massive. So let me, two things have happened with the Amish here in this last year. Um, you, uh, USDA came in and told the Amish, you cannot sell your eggs anymore because you didn't wash them and they didn't go through an FDA facility or USDA facility. They got some of the best produce on the planet and they were told governmentally that you're not allowed to openly sell them. So they're under the counter. So you walk in and go, Hey, you got eggs. And they're like, yeah. And they're under the counter. Nice. But here's his, here's the, uh, the post from the Amish farm down here. It says they're, they're in a, in a different roundabout way of cutting off the source. Cause when we went there, we used to be able to get our, you know, two gallons of whole milk, as much butter as we wanted, as much homemade cheese as we want. It was never ending. You, as long as you had money, you could go get whatever you want from there recently these last two or three times we've been back it's been like you're getting half a gallon of milk nothing else at all left no yogurt nothing so they sent this notice out to everybody uh as many of you are aware we are in the process of transitioning our dairy herd to seasonal milking this means that all the cows will calve and approximately the same time in spring so here's our current schedule we will discontinue milking the cows and taper milking until New Year's Day. Then we're going to quit milking. We're going to let the production dry up. That's from them. So what do they know about the, the current time coming in where they're telling you all these people that belong to the dairy herd share, uh, the milk herd or the herd owner's family, as what it, regular milk customers, that's drying up. So alternative sources would need to be found for the, like, you know, ourselves, we like that whole milk that comes because we know exactly what pastures they're on out there. They're not chemical, you know, trying to remove all the other weeds to bring up a certain species of hay or or whatever it is out there. Everything is just wild herd and they do, they rotate them around. So I know it's clean milk and I appreciate the, the health benefits of whole milk that's unpasteurized. But for them at that point now to cut off that source, now we have to go find another source. And this is where it comes to when you, the only reason I told you that is because you said second circle out. So that was our primary first circle. Now we have to go to a secondary circle, which we found another farm up near Knoxville doing some uh, herd shares as well. But now we're out to looking for different sources of food around in our community because the Amish are pulling back. And, you know, I talked to a few Amish guys up there and they're very aware of what's going on. And they told me directly, like, you know, if this does go down and we get the power outages and people start fleeing the cities, they're going to drop some huge trees on the roads. And they're like, you know, that'll stop some people, not all. A lot of people will walk in and they're like, we're just going to have to share with them. Like the Bible says, we're going to share our goods with them and hopefully they will join or help us produce food in the community. But I didn't want to be mean and be like, dude, it's not going to work like that. They're going to be like roaches coming in and grasshoppers to just come in and take everything and leave. And they're just, you know, one of the farms just about a mile from here. So we will help protect them. So even if you think you got your local level set, you better have a backup source or even a backup to the backup. Because when this starts going down, those people are going to stop selling. Hearing stories like that and a lot of the research you do and a lot of the stuff coming out, just in, even in mainstream publications, it just makes it so real. So for folks that are just sitting on their hands, like, I don't know what's going to have to happen to light a fire under your behind. If you're not acting now... And, you know, I think a lot of people get overwhelmed, right? Um, they may be living in, a, in an apartment, in a single family home, just watching videos and, and learning and learning. And they feel like, I just want people to know, you don't have to skip to the 10 acre, 23 acre property. You can start taking small steps right now. What can I do today, right? So for some people, and this is some stuff we'll teach in the workshop, you can go to start a community, you could join a community supported agriculture program. 
There's websites that can show you all the listings and stuff in your area. So that's where you pay, you know, 50, 100, 200 dollars a month. And there's a pickup location for local vegetables. It's really important to build these relationships with the local farmers. And that's something that we tried to do that we're doing with the meat share. It's like we want some face time. We want to shake their hands. We want to let them know that we're good people here in the community and we want to support their farm with our dollars and we want to bring them more business because you got to think like, OK, when things get tough, when markets dry up, when there's droughts, when there's shifts in the climate, what are these people going to do? Maybe they have a priority person that they're giving the food to. Maybe they want to give it to the store, or this, this, that and the other. So it's important that we we provide value to those people. One of my early mentors taught me. Uh, that we sh we we provide shared value based on shared values. So if you can find you know a farmer that is into freedom and stuff, and a lot of farmers are, they tend to be more independent. That's ideal as well, you know. And that's why it's important too that we learn these trades and skills within our own community. So it's really cool to hear that you guys are slaughtering sheep or, or slaughtering lamb. Those lamb ribs taste mighty fine, right? Um, there's all these skills that just got overlooked. Everything now, especially with the youth and mainstream America is getting shifted to this STEM stuff and it's science and technology and coding. And there's a place for that, right? We're connecting right now through the use of coding and the internet and stuff, but it's really important that we bring back those old world skills, uh, traditional skills, stuff that's just pretty freaking basic, but everybody takes it for granted because they got the grocery store. Well, as, as your listeners know, you're not always going to have the grocery store to go to. So where can you start? start one thing i learned from jack spirko the survival podcast i was talking about permaculture principles so when it comes to where you're going to grow your food on your property you walk out the back porch and the first square foot right there is where you should start your projects right so make it simple make it accessible container gardens raised bed gardens square foot gardening is a nice simple way one thing i was thinking about with this whole uh, grand solar minimum and these climate change shifts that's why permaculture is so important to, to have resilient systems that are able to grow and thrive on their own, it's more likely that these types of food production systems that are more in alignment with nature and the place that you live on, I think they'll be able to weather the storm better than simple row crops or especially than monocropping. So it's important that we have that, um, that multi-species involvement in the fruit trees and the food forest and stuff like that. And we're actually going to be joined by Paul Wheaton. He's one of the world's leading permaculture experts. He's going to be teaching in the workshop as well as Marjorie Wildcraft. She's awesome. She's She's been on point with her analysis for years now, but she really is good at teaching people how to grow as much food as possible in such a little space with little time and little energy input. So these are the kind of things that people need to be thinking about. And you got to ask yourself, if you don't have any type of food production going on, if you don't have a relationship with the farmers, what's it going to take to get you to take action on that front? Because the time, it's already past time. I was going to say the time is now. It's the, the time was a long time ago, my friends. And it's critical that we get going now. The best time to plant a fruit orchard, 10 years ago. There you go. You know Next I mean? best time. Uh, there's still community gardens, though. That, that's another thing. A community garden, uh, you know, they're already all they're asking for is come by and help and you still get some of the yield off that. And any yield is a positive yield. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at it, you know, OK, we got three different garden plots out here and we got so much food that we can't even eat. It's overgrowing. It's just so abundant. Like nature is so incredibly abundant. You have no idea. I mean, it, it, if you're growing too much, it's just too much to eat because it's so abundant. And then it's time to share. But getting the yield, you're not, you don't have to go for that ultimate yield. If you can just get one plan and understanding the basics of taking that almost unusable compacted clay soil and fluff that up and add some, you know, broken down wood in there and whatever else you can get in is, you know, something to get so roots can actually get down in there. Understanding what vermiculite is. Okay. Any, anything that you can do to turn that piece into a usable piece and then understand the process of getting that soil built. And once you get that, that's a skill set you can take anywhere because mm -hmm. there's always going to be somebody who knows less than you, but there's always going to be somebody who knows more than you. So that fine balance of imagine two permaculture experts coming together. And e even though one might be a super master and the other one is, you know, versed in it for 20 years and the other person's been doing it for 50 years, those two together, Oh man, that's like a hurricane of knowledge going to spread out and get you some yields out there. 
So it's never about the competition. It's about sharing that skill set. So either, you know, the more knowledge that's in that, the better the outcome will be. Any, any yield and any understanding of how that natural system works is so beneficial. That's a, a huge skill set. I really believe it's going to be part of our society moving forward. As much as anybody in the Wild West, building a fire and starting a fire was you had to know that or you wouldn't survive. It's going to be the same thing. You're going to have to know how to grow food in the process of building soils as much as they would have in the Wild West on how to uh, you know saddle up a horse. If you didn't know how to saddle a horse in 1850 in California, you were not there, period. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be the basic skills that are used at that skill set of the day. And I do believe growing our own food, we're going to revert back to that. Yeah, the skills are changing. And there's always like history has this pendulum effect where it goes to one extreme and then it goes to the other extreme. But we're seeing it swing to the tech right now technology, Zoom, and of course the lockdowns and the COVID policies exacerbated that with people working and going and kids going to school on Zoom, right? So it swung to technology and now we're swing, seeing it swing back, not for everybody, but for the people that matter, people are seeing what's going on and we're swinging it back. So those skills are critically important. And to be honest, it's not that easy to take something from seed to fruit, especially if you haven't ever done it before. Uh, like, especially in a place like Texas, man, to grow stuff in the summertime is really mm. hard. Ideally, you get something going, it's so healthy, and it just barely makes it through the summer, and then it starts springing back, right? But it's a challenge. And there's a lot of people out there that think they're going to be fine because they have the survival seed bank in the closet. And when crap hits the fan, they're going to take those seeds and plant them and voila, they'll be able to feed their family. No, it, it takes a lot of work, a lot of knowledge. You got to battle the climate. You got to battle the damn bugs that are they're competing for your resources, you know? Um, so like you said, the important thing is just to get started. I encourage people to start small and to start simple. For example, growing tomatoes, they grow really well in many different clients in many different areas. And even if you're in an apartment, get yourself a nice cl big clay pot, plant the tomato seed, nourish it, water it, pay attention to it, sing it little songs or whatever. And as it starts to spring up, you put a little tomato cage. When you start to see the fruit and then you could toss some cherry tomatoes in your salad, it's really fulfilling. It starts to kind of build some confidence in yourself. So you need to start getting that momentum. So I'd encourage people to start small, although I don't know, maybe we're past the time for starting small. Maybe you got to go big. But another big takeaway too is it takes a lot. It takes a really big garden and, to feed your family. Like you can't feed yourself 100% on your own garden unless you really got it going on and you have a bunch of bodies putting in a lot of time and energy to maintain, grow, and protect that garden. It takes a lot of work. And I think people might be missing that. So for the folks that have never grown their own food, they're in for a rude awakening if they think they're going to be able to just come and figure it out in the moment, especially if they're hungry and especially if their children are hungry. That's going to be a very anxiety inducing experience and it's going to be a challenge to learn so while the times are relatively normal while you still can drive to work get your paycheck while you still have electricity uh, i think it's really important to start that stuff now and like you said with the permaculture experts and stuff people that know how to grow food they love talking about it and they love teaching people about it so it's really important that we have that community that we find people but the important thing, really the starting point, is to make a decision and make a commitment to yourself that you're going to take this seriously and you're going to learn the skills necessary to weather the storm or better yet, to come out on the other side with a better life than you had before. Yeah, and I just want to share a little knowledge. So, you know, talking about the yields, our best performers, you know, this is just sharing a little bit. This year, okra, mm -hmm. we have red okra and the regular green okra. It's like a weed. It grows in. I love it with eggs, little slices, put it in. Yeah. The and there's so many ways to prepare it too. Like we boil it and then use uh, wasabi morning glory, plant those seeds, man, stuff. So all, all invasive and uh, sweet potatoes while the sweet potatoes are growing, we're always harvesting the leaf. That's a no brainer there. I mean, we got constant and continuous. And then um, the tomatoes that you're talking about, we found there's way, way higher yield doing cherry tomatoes versus like the red beefsteak tomatoes. You, you can't imagine how many were coming off. And we got the yellow ones, orange ones, red ones, uh, the small aromas. 
but the amount of tomatoes that we got per plant was astounding on the smaller little cherry tomatoes. So if you're going to be spending the time, go for those smaller ones because that is just outrageous on how much they produced. And then the uh, raspberries coming in too. They're starting to come in right now. We've got a couple of different varieties that are coming in different times of the year. And then, you know, look for the wild foraging because the uh, wild blueberries be coming up next month. They've already set flower and they're really an enormous amount of fruit on the tree. I mean, what's growing wild around your area there? I don't know. It sounds like an exciting time. What you got coming up here, homesteading on a budget. I definitely want to join that and take notes. You know, you can always learn something. So I even guarantee you master homesteaders and master gardeners are going to still be tuning in because there's always something else to learn. Because next day, there's another bit of knowledge that was found or learned about or expanded on. So, John, I appreciate you uh, spending the time with me today. Any closing thoughts for us? You know, with Live Free Academy, that's the company that puts on these workshops and stuff. We have this uh, empowerment philosophy. It's a four-part empowerment philosophy. And I'll, I'll just keep it real simple. And it's a framework that anyone can use to find success in their life and get stuff done. Four pieces. The first piece is mindset. You got to believe in yourself. You got to let go of all of the fear and inaction. And you got to cast a vision of what it is you want in life. And you got to really focus and get crystal clear on that vision and allow that vision to pull you and motivate you. And when you have a compelling vision for the future, it helps you to get through those challenging times. Maybe it'll help you to get through the 100 degree weather when you're sweating out in the garden, or it'll help you to put in that extra four hours of work in a day when you're real tired because you know that this time that you put in is going to pay off and help you to get the down payment for the property, right? It's all about the mindset. The next piece is just to have a good strategy. When I think of strategies, I think of how to get from here to there. What am I going to do in order to accomplish my goals? Goals is a huge piece of having a good strategy, have a solid plan. The third piece is to work with other people. Find people that share the same mindset and the same values and get people invested in your plan. Make it a community plan. Make it a freedom cell group plan. Make it a family plan, right? So strategy, mindset, work with the team. And the final piece is to take massive action. Sometimes to clear the way for taking action, you got to give some things up. Like maybe instead of going out and having drinks during happy hour with your friends, you come home and you start on the garden bed. Maybe instead of enjoying leisure time all Saturday and Sunday, to be honest, if you don't have a good food production system going, if you don't have relationships with local farmers, you don't have time for their leisure time. I don't know if you deserve leisure time if you don't have your, your crap together, you know? So you gotta take massive action towards those goals. And so that's just something that I always think about when I have a project like this workshop, for example, I just go through these four pieces, the Live Free Academy Empowerment Philosophy, and it really helps me to get clear and it empowers me to take action towards the pursuit of the good life. Anyway, John, I appreciate you joining me and anybody out there, please feel free to contact John, drop some comments and thanks for uh, spending your valuable time with us and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.